Okay, we're yeah, we not stopping at 31 seconds. Start, Let's start. listen to Discovery's Bruce Buckingham, Public Affairs Officer, for the final of stage the of this countdown functions. of the Space Shuttle Discovery Crew 7, the second launch after Columbia. 15, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Start, main engine start, two, one, booster ignition, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery, returning to the space station, paving the way for future missions beyond. Space, space Shuttle traveling already well in excess of 100 miles an hour. Houston now controlling the flight of Discovery. The Space Shuttle begins the journey back into orbit. Discovery completes its role. The shuttle now heads down wings level for the 8.5 of orbit. Discovery's three liquid fuel main engines now throttle back to 67% of rated performance, reducing the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. Discovery already three and a half miles in altitude, one and a half miles downrange, traveling almost 750 miles an hour. Everything looking good on the bird. 57 seconds into the flight, engines beginning to this rev up. Rob Davies at Johnson Space Center in Houston as he walks us through this, and as you can see right there, we have an estimated sense of the trajectory based on previous launches, so you can get a sense of how quickly and how fast they're moving and how fast their altitude is increasing. The throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Steve Lindsay. Expected day to hit to clear shortly. Copy. Lindsay joined on the flight deck by pilot Mark Kelly, flight engineer Lisa Nowak, and mission specialist Mike Fossum. Mission specialists Pierce Sellers, Stephanie Wilson, and Tomas Ryder of the European Space Agency down on the mid deck. Ryder headed for six months on the International Space Station. One minute, 47 seconds into the flight, 22 miles in altitude, 18 miles downrange, traveling 2,600 miles an hour, standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Now, solid rocket booster separation is a point where every astronaut breathes a little bit easier, and that is going to happen uh, very shortly. It's the first two minutes and 15 seconds. Solid rocket booster separation confirmed. Guidance now converging. Discovery's onboard computers commanding the main engine nozzles to swivel, aiming the shuttle for its precise target in space for main engine cutoff. We should have a good forward link now on S10. Right, that's a good moment there, isn't it, Jim Absolutely. Riley? Yeah, you sound good. Now getting very smooth inside, and uh, they're above Mach 5 right now. That two minute and 15 second period with those solid Two minutes, 35 seconds into the flight, It is uh, a much rougher ride. Discovery. It's a violent ride, and as I said, within eight seconds, they're going 100 miles an hour to give you a sense of the speed. It's hard to imagine that when you've got this four and a half million pound vehicle. Uh, at this point, it gets very smooth, and there's a constant sense of acceleration. Tell us about that. Exactly. For the next six and a half minutes after we jettison the the uh, SRBs, then it's a uh, pretty smooth ride all the way to orbit. And right now, they've just made it past the uh, two-engine TAL call for Marone, which will, if we have any kind of engine problem, then they'll, they'll abort to Marone in Spain. So in other words, they're not coming back here at this point. As they, go, as they get higher, essentially, the, the, the options for an abort get greater, right? Yeah, in about another minute, we'll hear that negative return call, which means that they have no options for coming back here and that anything happens, we'll continue on and go across the Atlantic. That's the four-minute mark, and that's an important mark. Never seen a shuttle have to do that. We're looking very closely as well as we look at, at the onboard cameras on uh, the external fuel tank for Discovery. Uh, all eyes will be trained to see if there's any debris that's come off. Have you seen any, Jim? So far, it's looking very clean. All right, negative return. So if something were to happen now, it means perhaps a transatlantic abort, perhaps going to Marone, Spain, maybe an abort to orbit, which means they would get a, a lower, but a, at least an, an Earth orbit. Exactly. In fact, in about a minute, we'll hear that press to ATO, which is abort to orbit. And you got the negative return call. So they won't be coming back to RTLS. They're flying a profile, or they flew a profile that had a little less power in the equation in an effort to try to avoid uh, kicking off debris where the atmosphere is thickest. Uh, explain, does that, how much does that uh, make it more difficult to get to the space station ultimately? 
Of course, the slower you go, the less of a trajectory or, or an energetic trajectory you have. So they'll have a slightly different profile than most of our flights would have. In this particular case, they're going supersonic at about one minute. And that was the point where they, they actually throttled down a little earlier and throttled back up a little bit later so they could reduce the aero loads on the tank and hopefully have less material be shed off of it or less likely, likelihood of material to be shed from the tank. Now traveling in excess of 6,300 miles an hour, an altitude of 66 miles. The boundary of space is... Roughly 60 miles. Right there, so yep. they're in space. So they're, and here in just a minute, you'll see in the external tank camera, you'll see the orbiter actually rolled heads up at about Mach 13. Wow, let's watch that. And the, what's the reason for doing that at that point? They've been going kind of upside down almost up until that point. Why? One of the big reasons is that we have a stored program command on board that will then transition from the comm here on the ground, where they're talking to ground sites, to talking to our, our antenna. Right there the they go. Antennas will be talking to the satellites on board the TDRA satellites uh, here in about another 45 seconds. Yeah. So in other words, they're going from ground stations to satellites right in this moment as we see this right here. Exactly. And from here on, they'll be talking through the ta satellites to mission control. Minutes, fascinating. Well, we are now at a point, uh, we are six minutes and 20 seconds in, so about two minutes away from that external fuel tank being jettisoned. And as it goes, will we see that camera picture? Will it stay live? It should. Last time, as I recall, it did. It was quite a spectacular picture as we saw the orbiter and the external tank separate. This is the external fuel tank, the source of all the uh, focus of all the attention and the source of uh, that foam shedding problem. It's the only piece of the shuttle combination that is not returned and reused. And uh, after, after it's used today, it uh, gets deorbited in several thousand pieces over the Indian Ocean. Yeah, what they got right now is a pressed uh, main engine cutoff, which is a good point. That means everything's looking great. Their goal for all the maneuvers that they'll do after, uh, after they reach orbit. So everything's looking great. So I, I didn't hear a single thing that uh, the Commander Steve Lindsay or uh, Mark, Pilot Mark Kelly had to deal with on the way up and that was not what you would consider normal. Exactly. Everything is uh, basically looking pretty nominal so far. So all those hours in simulation wasted. <laughs> it didn't, who needs it, right? Uh, planning for all those scenarios that just didn't happen. At what point are you euphoric? Not until you unstrap and uh, start floating around? Well, the point that really uh, will get the rookies will be the point where we hit uh, main engine cutoff at Miko in about a minute. And uh, when we get that call, they will uh, be taking their helmets off shortly after that and getting the first chance to really be in zero G. Until those engines cut off, you're still getting pressed. Are you getting a lot of G-forces at this point still? Right now, they're, they're seeing uh, 3G throttling about the last minute and 50 seconds or so of the, uh, of, of, uh, the powered flight. And so you can start to see in that image a little bit of the, uh, the plasma that's being generated around the vehicle as it's continuing to fly uphill. And here, very shortly, uh, they'll hit main engine cutoff in about 15 seconds. So it actually generates the plasma that we associate with re-entry on ascent as well, which reminds us of how the energy is get given and taken away in spaceflight, isn't it? And even though they're fairly high right here, there's still a little bit of atmosphere, and they'll be aiming for a point to where uh, they'll in about 48 minutes after launch and main engine cutoff. All right, main engine cutoff just happened. Reports. And now the next moment will be the booster separation. When's that going to occur? Yes. That's pretty shortly after that. Tank separation should occur just any second now. Yeah. Just watch that. There it, goes. there it goes. There you see Discovery and that uh, external fuel tank You'll party see company. see here in just a second on the screen. And there it is. External tank separation confirmed. Commander Steve Lindsay now maneuvering Discovery to the correct orientation so that video and digital stills of the external tank can be captured by cameras embedded in the shuttle's umbilical well. A smooth ride to orbit. You're listening to Rob Navy as public affairs officer in Houston. They'll also to attempt to take some pictures of handheld cameras on board, which will give them yet another opportunity to see what exactly is and is not on that presentation of the runway. Tell us what's going on in your mind right now, what you're well, trying to do. Well, he wants to see the runway. He's ready to break out of the clouds, and it's going to be a, a big sigh of relief when that runway shows up, which should be here at about 11,000 feet.
Okay, this is the ground camera that All you're right, seeing. So that, that means it broken out of the clouds because they went to the ground camera. Or this uh, this might be an air-to-air -air shot. I'm not quite sure. But uh, w they were just about to come through the clouds, and they switched this shot. Now he's got a view of the runway. And I want to remind people, we're talking about something that is on the order of 15 to 20 times steeper than a commercial airline landing, right? That's right. It's about oh, a 20-degree glide slope. Feet. And at 2,000 feet, he's going to start a pre-flare maneuver. He'll very gently bring the nose of the shuttle up. And the pilot, Mark Kelly, will drop the gear, the and we're shooting for a landing at about uh, just over 200 All knots. Yeah, good. it's you know it looks a little murky there. They had a high cloud deck, but it's it's still perfectly good weather for landing there. Okay, so now we're at 24, 2200 feet at about 300 knots. What's he doing now? Here he okay, is in the flare, this is right? The, this is the pre-flare maneuver. You see those two triangles to the right and left of his guidance. He has to pull up the nose and follow those triangles. And of course, he's looking at the runway. He's got lights called a ball bar, and he's got to keep the red light on the white bar to right. stay on the inner glide slope. Landing gear down. We've got about 15 seconds to landing. Uh, you want that landing gear to work, don't you? Well, good thing it works every time, huh? Landing gear, uh, there's actually quite a bit of redundancy to get the gear down if the primary system doesn't work. You have backups. Okay, and here he's looking down the runway, shooting for about 205 knots. Looking really good. Very smooth landing. Oh, just greased it. This is now. It, right now. Did drag shoot? It, and I remember the time I flew it in the simulator, you have to kind of push the control stick forward to get the nose down. If you don't do that, it'll slam down. And you want to make sure that down. nose goes down softly, too. That's right? right. Touchdown at 205, and then at 185 knots, the commander will just make a very gentle input into the stick to bring the nose gear down. And Discovery you want to keep that structural load low on the main, on the nose, the nose gear. The and it looks like he did a really nice job here. John Zarelli, you're right there. You heard the sonic booms. You saw it just come in. What's it looking like there to you? Yeah, Miles, we did. And we didn't get a good look at it until the very last minute uh, because of that low deck of clouds. We heard that double sonic boom. And in fact, a few minutes before that, Miles, before the touchdown, uh, there were some folks on the other side of the runway uh, firing off compression guns to chase the birds away, which, of course, is always a big concern, I'm sure. But, boy, that was picture perfect, just smooth coming in. Uh, but, yeah, we didn't catch it till about 45 seconds uh, before actual touchdown because of that low cloud deck. Miles? Yeah, the, that twin sonic boom, though, was quite quite a sound. It really does wake you up, doesn't it? Yeah, no question about it. Everybody up here for a second was going, what was that? People who weren't familiar with it. But that was that twin sonic boom. About three and a half minutes before touchdown, we heard that twin right, sonic boom. Stop. Welcome back to Discovery, and congratulations on a uh, great mission, expanding our knowledge and experience with orbiter repair and bringing the space station back to a full crew complement. We have no immediate deltas to post-landing, and we'll meet you on page 5-3.